Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. In this video, I'm continuing the analysis of uh, international war and terrorism. Um, specifically, I'm going to look in more detail on um, the relationship between uh, game theory and game trees in an attempt to understand and analyze strategically um, international war. But prior to this discussion, I went through and did um, a somewhat formal analysis of the use of um, non-cooperative, um, decision-based, non-cooperative game um, theory to analyze uh, conflict. And specifically, now I'm going to be able to use that information and analyze and discuss uh, James D. Morrow's The Ongoing Game Theoretic Revolution. So this uh, section 1.5.1 uh, comes from page 164 to 192 in Bidlarski's book. Um, I'm going to have to break um, Morrow's uh, discussion up into sections because the, the text is a little dense, um, and I'm not going to be able to cover everything that he says um, in the ongoing game theoretic revolution in one in one one section. So I'm going to break this up into uh, as many sections as I need to get through uh, uh, Morrow's analysis. So with that, let's begin. This is international international war and terrorism. And this is, uh, this is uh, the ongoing, the ongoing game theoretic, M E T H E O R E T I C. The ongoing game theoretic revolution, and this is by James D. Morrow, section. Section uh, one five one. Okay. Um, first thing, game theory. This is uh, according to Moreau. Um, game theory provides a flexible and useful tool to create formal models, right? Formal models of strategic interaction um, presented in theories of war, right? Um, so, formal models, right? strategic models. Um, for this interaction. We know from the last discussion that the nodes within the strategic model um, and the strategic interaction within the model is going to identify points or instances of decision making. Right? So parties at nodes will have options. We recognized also that these options are mutually exclusive. You can't both choose to escalate and de-escalate the war. You can either escalate the war or you can de-escalate the war. Um, and what we're going to look at today is an understanding, um, at least an, an initial attempt to understand in a little bit more complexity um, what we've already discussed, <clears throat> which is the uh, information set, the structure of the nodes, the moves, the outcomes, and the relationships. Um, so we'll be returning to, I'll be returning to the, the previous discussion on um, the nodes within the game uh, tree, and we'll analyze in a little bit more complexity, just a little bit more complexity, um, the relationship between actors in the game. Also, as I said, um, the version of the game that I created is a non-traditional version of the game. I don't, you know, I didn't want to present the information in all of its sort of mathematical glory because it would just make the discussion more complicated than it needs to be. All that's really important is that you have an understanding on what the function of um, the game is, especially if the game that we're talking about is sort of strategic war analysis. Um, that's all I'm interested in here. All the other sort of very, very heady, very, very technical aspects of um, game theory and game tree construction and design and analysis is 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 not. It's not. Uh, it's not something that I'm going to engage in uh, on YouTube. Okay. Um, so we talked about non-cooperative game theory. So let's look at this again. Right. Non-cooperative game theory. Um, the first thing that we see, um, Moreau says, it is a mathematical theory for strategic interactions, right? We want to emphasize both terms, strategic and interactions. I'm going to sort of de-emphasize the mathematical part. Um, there is a mathematics to this. I'm not going to get involved at all in the mathematics because for an introduction to the concept, the mathematics is just complicated. It's not really difficult mathematics at all, but um, the mathematics will complicate uh, the discussion. What I'm more interested in 
is being able to communicate the function and the the function of the the um, the theory, the function and the use of the analysis and an analysis of strategies for war options, right? So specifically, we're interested in strategic. strategic interactions. We talked about the interactions in the last video. I talked about the interactions in the uh, CPE-1704 TKS video. Um, this video, I'm not going to talk about the interactions as much as I'm going to emphasize the strategies. And what Moreau does um, before he actually begins the analysis is he gives a very, very solid sort of um, um, theoretical uh, synopsis of the key component constituent parts within game theory, and, and those parts are important to fully understand the complexity of, of the game. Uh, again, I'm not going to um, discuss the mathematical complexities that evolve. I'm only concerned with the interaction and strategic complexities that evolve, right? And this is why I modified um, my particular version of the game. It's just a better pedagogical device, I find. Okay, I, again, we already know this. I'm not going to write it on the board. Number two is... Um, this non-cooperative game theory is part of uh, decision theory. We talked about that. I talked about that in the last video. We recognize again that the nodes are points or instances of de decisions, um, and also that the game takes place atemporally. Right? Actors can make simultaneous decisions. One actor can make a decision before the other, uh, vice versa. I got a question um, from a viewer that I didn't discuss on what if. Um, both actors refuse, or either actor refuses to make a decision at a particular mo node. So before I go on, I just want to clarify that. So if we have um, something like this, right? Let's say we have something like this. And we have, let's say, a refusal to decide, right? A refusal to decide. Well, with respect to um, the particular game that I constructed, um, escalation or de-escalation of conflict. If the party to the conflict refuses to decide at that particular node, at that decision node, you cannot determine whether or not that is going to either escalate or de-escalate the conflict. And I'll give you two examples. If the refusal to make a decision um, functions under the, the, the uh, functions rather within the context of, um, I am not going to engage or escalate this war. I'm not going to de-escalate this war, I want to stay out of this war, right? But my absence outside of this war causes or, or leads to the, you know, the extermination of innocent lives. Then my inaction escalated the conflict. However, my inaction wasn't a consequence of my decision making, right? So formally, you can't incorporate that escalation as a consequence of the decision making because it happened indirectly. We are, we are interested specifically in consequences that arise as a direct result of um, an actor's decisions, D-E-C-I-S-I, right? Um, what we're interested in um, though there is there is a way of incorporating sort of a refusal to decide, what we're interested in is the direct relationship between an actor's um, decision-making process at a point of decision, at a node of decision, and the effects that that decision have on the overall, two things, on the overall game and on the anticipated or desired outcomes of the game. Um, those decisions are those consequences, outcomes, that follow from an inability to act aren't directly attributable to the decision-making node or the, the node of decision. So it, it, it's outside of the game, formally speaking. So again, um, within the game, we're only concerned with decisions that are made <clears throat> and decisions that influence the consequences. Uh, and this is how the game is being structured. So I should have made that point clear in the last video. Um, a, a new concept to introduce in this series uh, is the following, right? Um, Moreau m reminds us that actions are classified as perfect, right? So we can talk about perfect actions. Right? Actions are classified as perfect if they serve the best interest of the actor, right? An action is considered perfect if the action serves my best interest. 
obviously, it's simple to talk about um, actions that are perfect in a vacuum.